introduce all the panel members to you, and we'll actually have them come up and speak in the order that they're sitting, if that's okay with you. Um, each one of them has a unique quality. Uh, they're not necessarily in farming, but they're all very concerned about food. And I myself am not a gardener, I'm a beekeeper. So I do my part, raising butterflies, and worms, and bunnies, and bees, to uh, contribute and give back to my community and to my neighborhood. And so these ladies, with the things that they're doing, are also giving back to the community. And so we're going to hear from each one of them. Each one will speak for about 15 minutes, and then afterwards, uh, we'll have all of you uh, share your questions. So we only have one microphone today, so if you want to ask a question, please come up at the end and um, pose your question at that time. So to my left here, I have Penny Harmeyer. She is a beekeeper, and her husband, Ken, has worked together with us in various panels to talk about the plight of the bees. And so she's going to share from a woman's point of view where she assists her husband in gathering swarms and taking care of bees and uh, harvesting honey. And um, this is Penny Harmeyer. Uh, then we have um, Allison Wolchinski, who is from Hu'u Ohoku Ranch on Molokai. And she has been there uh, for about a year and um, has a lot of experience in organic farming. So we're very grateful to have her here today to share her expertise. Then we have um, Kai Henson, who is a farmer and is co-owner of Green Rose Farm in Waimanalo. She is a member of the Farmers Union, which is the alternative to the Farm Bureau. And she's gonna share a little bit about her experience on the farm as well as being part of Farmers Union, which is uh, some, an organization which I encourage all of you to join, even though you're not a farmer, to support this group in providing an alter alternative solution to farming rather than just going with big farming, and industrial farming. Uh, this is the way we have to go in the future, where we have many, many small farmers young people who are encouraged to get out there and start working the land again, rather than sitting in the corporate chair and hoping that they will uh, become millionaires. <laughs> so uh, then we have uh, Catherine Sheehan, and she has run for office. She is the head of the Civic Alliance to Stop Slavery, and has been very much involved down at the legislature and the city council, talking about our homeless problem as well as human trafficking and um, labor abuses. So I hope she'll be talking about that too today. And then we have, um, we have Juanita Kawamoto Brown, who is the head of the Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party. And she has been very instrumental in bringing information out to the members of the Democratic Party about how important it is to label GMO. And uh, with her knowledge, she's actually able to convince many of the people who knew nothing about GMO before uh, the importance of labeling as well as avoiding pesticides and GMO products. So each of these women will share in turn, and I really thank you all for coming today. Um, I think this is going to be a really exciting evening, so thank you. So. Start with Penny Harmeyer, and let's have Penny come up to the uh, mic and um, share her expertise. Right on the microphone. Yeah. On the microphone. Yeah. Okay, it's a lot of <laughs> Yeah.
she was just awesome. And that is my thing. I am a grandmother. I have four great grandchildren. And I'm not great grandchildren, but they're wonderful grandchildren. And that is my thing. I want to just grab every child and take them, put them in a bee suit, and show them what the bees can do. They already know that they can eat honey with their peanut butter. They know that they can see the bees go from flower to flower. And most kids understand that. We've got wonderful movies out there that aren't quite as uh, politically correct or actually accurate because in a hive, who knows who the worker bees are? Are they male or female? female. Yes, they're female. Men, sorry to tell you guys, <laughs> you are only there for procreation and not even for that hive. It's okay. You are for the other hives that are out away from us. You also get a very great little opportunity if you're a drone. You're going to be in that hive and they're going to just stay there with you. They're going to feed you, but you know what? If there's a time of famine, you're going to be the first to go. <laughs> so that's the situation. So it's really funny to, to, to just work like with kids and you tell, you've got boys and girls, and the boys are like, well, what do you mean? We're like, yeah, you're, you're not going to be around. We're going to be around, but you're not. But that's not very nice. But we all want to be around now. My husband and I have been doing this for over 11 years, and we are not in it to make a million dollars. Like she was saying, it doesn't happen. Um, if you have a lot of highs, it does. But we are dealing with a varroa mite and a small hive beetle. A small hive beetle is half the size of our black babies. What happens with those? They get into a hive, they can destroy a big hive in less than two weeks. So that is a big problem. We don't do anything with pesticides, we are totally pesticide free. We do everything organically. We use oil traps in our hives. That the bees have learned to herd these. There we go. To herd beetles into the traps, and then beetles die. So that works out for us. We also put special uh, mesh bottoms so that when the larvae falls out of the hive, it falls to the ground. We also have our hives at least two feet off the ground, so they can't get. That. So that's ways that we're mitigating the problem. Uh, in Hawaii, that is the biggest problem uh, that we're having right now. People say that the world might is bad, but not really. Not as bad as this people. Uh, we have highs in different parts of the island. We are actually fortunate to have highs on Kua Kua Ranch. It's the first highs on their ranch in over 20 years. And they're doing a farm to table situation there at the restaurant. So our bees are the ones pollinating their fruits and vegetables. And one other cool thing that they grow there, they grow a lufa. Do you guys ever see a lufa? That is so cool. You don't know, see that vine like that. I did about a week ago. And that's the neatest thing. So there's what they're doing there at the ranch is they're taking them, slicing them up, and putting soap in them. And then they're perhaps selling them at the store. Um, but I don't know what else to tell you about bees. Our bees are just my babies. Um, I'm also a photographer, so there's a slide show going on. It's just some small stuff. It's nothing <laughs> fancy, but that's my passion over there. It's just the bees. And like I said, the children. Uh, we have currently 15 hives. We have them in Wailua, Wainai, Kulua Ranch, Wailua, which is where I live. And I bet you don't know, we have six hives on our Lanai right now. We're waiting to go to farm. But what we do is we go and catch swarms out of people's trees and then we bring them home, keep them in our house for about two to three months, make sure that they're strong enough, and then we'll move them out to a farm or someone's house if they want them. We actually have a hive at our house right now. We're working with another group from Hawaii Kai that's going to watch the community center. So there, there's this beautiful bee box. One of my friends, her name is Pam, she painted it. So it's got all these beautiful flowers on it. It's gorgeous. My boxes are just white. Boring. Hers are just going. That one is getting ready. I was just watching them today, and they're just going in and out. And in a small hive like that, which is there's probably twenty to thirty thousand bees. In a regular large mainstream hive, which has twenty frames in it, there's over sixty thousand bees. So um, the other things that we do, like I said, we go and collect swarms. We did a swarm last last night in Wahiwa. There was a lychee tree and there was a ball of bees, literally this big, that we 
captured. And we put them in and we brought them home. Well, today it's been rather warm. So they were outside of this new, and they were doing what they call bearding. They are hanging off the edge. It's too hot inside because they um, regulate the temperature inside by having more or less bees, and then, of course, fluttering their wings. So that is the background for us. survivors and they were pollinators. Uh, the Corolians and Italians tend to be the ones that pack away the honey and they're quick and they're very good. And um, you know, we just have just fun every every day going out taking care of the bees. It's become, it's, it's a hobby but yet it's become a lot more work. Like I said with the pests that we deal with, we put in the hives these troughs that have vegetable oil in, they have a grate on top of it, the bees have actually learned to hurt the beetles into those, and they drown, so that's why we have to go and change them periodically, we'll wash it every two to three weeks. Uh, the other thing the bees have learned to do to, uh, on their own is that they will build walls with uh, comb, with wax, and they will hurt the bees in and close it up. So they're making beetle jails all by themselves. So they realize, you know, these guys are a problem. The other thing is the varroa mite, which is years ago, that was what was the big thing in 2007. Those are inside with the baby bees. So they are born with the bees. So they were born on their backs and they're sucking their blood like a vampire. And that's not good. But the bees have actually learned to groom each other. And that's another way. And also different places like UH are trying to create new strains of bees that can also be more uh, feisty, I guess, you know, and more, and just they're, they're trying to learn how to get the right bees together that can fight off these pests. And every time you think about 
these past, the bees, like I said, you know, I said two weeks that this beetle can kill a hive that's got over 60,000 bees. It won't necessarily kill them, it will make them move. But that's still difficult because here we have so much construction and you have people, these bees swarming at the weirdest times. They never used to swarm early in the year. They've been swarming all year round now. And that's because of all of the different buildings that's going on everywhere, the construction. And we have found that to be uh, maybe the last two, three years. Before it used to be April to June. And then again later in the year, about August, you know, September to November, somewhere around there. But now it's just all the time we're getting phone calls. We also get phone calls from people that have bees in their walls. And we're currently trying to get legislature together, we're getting information together to start with it, to put a bill up that says that if you have bees in your house or on your property, to call a beekeeper first before you call the pest control people. Because we don't even know. We can't, you know, we just can't afford to. If all the bees in the world went away, Three years from now, you wouldn't be eating much but potatoes and grains, and that's really not what I like. I like, I like my strawberries. I like my lily koi. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's kind of how I feel, and it's just something really important. I also have started a group. It's called Wahini Beekeepers. So obviously, as the name says, it's for girls, but you know, <laughs> anybody can join in. But I want to get that going. I actually have a full-time job, so it's kind of hard. But what I want to do is get more people involved and have just a hive, maybe, you know, in your neighborhood. Not necessarily at your house, but somebody's got property somewhere that you could put a hive and you get another group of ladies together or people together and start. As soon as we get, you know, we keep getting more and more hives. When they swarm and they go out and they make feral hives, we're better off. Because managed hives are good, but we need them out in the wild. Because then they can help fend off things on their own. And that's, that's another process that's going on too. Because we lost probably over 90% of our feral hives in 2007 for the viral mite. And now, so that's why we are all so adamant about, don't call the pest man, you know, just call us. You know, it's just one of those things that we want done. So, anyway, that's me. Thank you. So much, Penny. I know it's a terrifying experience to do public speaking, but <laughs> at some point you get over it. <laughs> so anyway, um, thanks so much for sharing with us, Penny. I, I'm also a beekeeper, and I'm not going to take too much of your time because I've already spoken about bees quite extensively. But what I'm finding, finding where I live is that the bees are swarming a lot, and I believe it's. Um, because it's a residential area, they're reacting more to the Roundup and the pesticides that are being sprayed in backyards. So um, we're complaining about the neonicotinoids, which are seeds which have been coated with pesticide, which we knew from the very beginning, and as did the chemical companies from the very beginning, that um, these seeds would kill the bees because systemically uh, they're already, uh, they've already got the pesticide in them, so when that plant becomes uh, a big plant, then those bees take the pollen, uh, they alight on the leaves, and um, they become infected or affected by that pesticide. So the Roundup is affecting them, um, all the chemicals. If you think, if you're out on a day um, walking by the stream and you can take a whiff of some kind of chemical, just that little bit can affect you. And some of you are young enough to remember when uh, they were spraying DDT from trucks. So back then we thought it was just a fun thing. And I've seen pictures where people actually uh, are dancing in the sprays of the, yeah. of the pesticides coming out of the backs of the trucks or ac actually being doused with a chemical as they're <coughs> eating, eating. And this was DDT, which eventually got banned. But we're dealing with new kinds of chemicals, new kinds of pesticides today, and they're all harmful. You can never dilute any chemical enough to make it harmless. And until we get to the point where we understand that we have to go organic if we're gonna survive as a planet, uh, then we're long lost. Uh, and if the corporate agriculture is gonna continue to say, 
We're following instructions, we read the labels, we instruct our employees what to do when they're using the chemicals. As long as you buy into that, unfortunately, we're going to continue to suffer from pesticide poisoning at some level. So I'm very concerned about what's happening to the bees. I see my bees leaving, just like you said, at any time. If it's too hot out like it was last year, uh, they just take off. Even if you've been taking care of them, treating them, inspecting them, not putting any chemicals in their hives, they still uh, are very temperamental and they say, we're out of here. So one day you may have five hives, the next day you may only have two. And uh, this is an unfortunate situation right now, but um, this is what we're dealing with worldwide. So I'd like to bring on the next speaker. Her name is Allison Wotunski. She is from um, Pupu, oh, Hoku Ranch on Molokai. And she would like to share with you her experience as an organic farmer there on Molokai. Thank you. Still in shock hearing that I'm not gonna make a million dollars. I'm just kidding. Um, so thank you. My name is Allison Matunsky, and um, I'm one of two farm managers at Puahoku Ranch on Molokai. My co-manager is over there, Bart Di Fiore. Um, <laughs> uh, so actually, Bart and I have been farming together for a couple years now, and I thought that I would talk a little bit about my background farming. Um, and then maybe at the end you guys will have some questions for me. So I actually started farming about maybe seven years ago at an organization in Massachusetts where I'm originally from called The Food Project. And the approach um, with The Food Project is a little bit more of a social justice agriculture organization. And that's where most of my experience has come from. So Dr. Yee was really nice in saying that I have a lot of experience with organic farming, but the majority of my farming background is definitely through the lens of social justice and food distribution, maybe even more so than actual production, although that's what I'm doing now. So the Food Project is a pretty unique organization. Um, the work that they do meets at the intersection of youth, food, and community. So uh, basically farming at the Food Project is a vehicle for creating social change. So the easiest way to explain um, the work that they do and what I did there for five years is mostly um, by hiring teenagers to work on farms. We would bring together uh, groups of youth that kind of under normal circumstances would, would normally never meet. So youth from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, the commonality was that they were all working together on a farm. So they would work together. It was a paid job through the summer and the academic year. Uh, for about half the day, every day, and then in the afternoon they were in a social justice and sustainable agriculture curriculum. So the idea was that we would bring together people that would normally never meet, have them together working, doing something that they otherwise would never do, had never done before, in this case farming, and then kind of talk about all the things that come up when you have a really diverse group of people um, working together in an intimate environment. So part of my job was facilitating those programs and teaching um, those workshops on the farm. So we talked about all different kinds of things from gender issues to sexual identity to poverty to food security, all different kinds of things. Um, so I worked at the Food Project doing that type of work for five years on both really small urban farms and pretty big for that area rural farms and um, anywhere from like a quarter of an acre to 30 acres. We did not have a, an organic certification um, which is something that's actually pretty interesting with my background in Massachusetts and the, and the farming culture there versus what I've noticed in Hawaii. So did not have an organic certification. The organization obviously still exists and, and they don't have a certification, but definitely, um, you know, I'd like to think better than, you know, the organic certification requirements, very sustainable practices. So I worked there for five years and then I really wanted to focus on farming. Uh, sustainable farming and Bart's family owns a farm. Uh, they have one of the few remaining family uh, owned and operated farm stands just north of Boston. And so I worked there for two years helping him on the farm and then we ended up here in Hawaii. So we've been here for about a year and a half. I'll tell you a little bit about Kuhoku Ranch. It's a, a 14,000 acre cattle ranch. Um, the farm is like a small farm on a big ranch, so we're about 30 acres. Uh, if you're like a three-person team, it's me, Bart, our co-worker, Kaoki. Our main crops are vegetables, fruits, and ava or kava. 
Um, we, we're not, we don't have like 30 acres in production. We have about a five acre, one acre veggie block rotation going on. So at any given time, we have about two acres um, of in vegetable production. We have about four acres in fruit production. We grow you know, a variety of citrus, avocado, um, mostly bananas, and then we have about four acres of ava in production. So it's, you know, it's a very big piece of land, very small and scale farm. At Puahoku, we do have an organic certification and a biodynamic <coughs> certification, so we have both of those going on. Um, so transitioning from a four season climate to a subtropical climate in Hawaii has definitely been a really fun challenge over the past year and a half. Um, it's, yeah, it's been really cool. There's a lot of different variables that Bart and I deal with versus in New England and some of the same. I think that we thought it was going to be, you know, pretty easy to like grow food when it's warm all the time. Um, it's definitely not the case. There's a lot of other variables that we deal with. So it's been a really fun learning experience doing that. Um, my focus area on the farm tends to usually always be drawn to distribution. That's what I'm really interested in. Um, I care a lot about who's getting our food and where it's going. And our work on Molokai has been pretty focused on making sure that there's a more secure food system there. So making sure that our food is staying on island and then within the Hawaiian Islands. So the majority of the food that we grow stays on the island of Molokai, other than shipping to Kukua is really our only off-island vendor, so here in Honolulu. Um, we're pretty small scale in our distribution. We sell at the local farmer's market on the island, um, where the ranches were pretty far removed. We're about an hour from the main town of Kanakakai, so we sell there once a week. We have kind of a very small and formal CSA program, mostly friends that live along the way that we deliver produce to. You can rent cottages, and we have a hospitality unit at the ranch, so the majority of our produce stays there for that hospitality unit, so folks that are staying on the ranch can have the option of buying produce because it is about an hour to the nearest store. Um, so pretty small scale in that way. Uh, we There was not much of a farm program when Bart and I first came to Pohoku, so we've built this up over the past year and a half, and it's you know definitely evolving. It's not set in stone where it is, so we're always happy to add on new clients like Kakua, um, which has been really great for us because it enabled us to kind of stabilize our, our sales. You know, one of the challenges when you're providing the majority of your food to like one um, market, like our hospitality unit, is that when we would have dips and things like that, we need other places to sell all the food that we have. So Kaku has been a really great, stable, and consistent market for us to do that. Um, I don't know much about our beef and livestock operation, which is what my coworker Jan was going to speak about, but if there are questions at the end in regards to that, um, I'm happy to, to attempt to answer. Our beef does have the same organic and biodynamic certification when it's raised on the property because of Legality is around slaughterhouses. There are no organic certified slaughterhouses in Hawaii. So once you know the animals are processed into you know food product, they, they don't have that certification on them anymore. But they're raised following organic and biodynamic practices. So again, I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end. Um, I think that's pretty much it for now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you who just arrived, thank you very much for coming. And we have Roger Clemente, who was running for uh, Senator Nishihara's seat in Pearl City. Thank you for coming. Uh, we had a meeting last Monday uh, of the health committee of the Pearl City uh, Neighborhood Board. And uh, it was really interesting to have the Monsanto representatives there who were very, very sure that they were contributing to the economy here. But uh, we're going to have a counter meeting <laughs> next May to be able to talk uh, our side of the story, have organic farmers come, have representatives from the farmers union to come to speak about the necessity of a sustainable agriculture and supporting the organic farmers. So uh, for those of you who are still standing, if you'd like to take a seat up front here and then we'll bring on the next speaker. Okay, so we have Kai Hinson from Green Rose Farm. She's in Waimanalo, is an organic farmer and uh, is also contributing to the Farmers Union, uh, getting that established and supporting all the farmers out there who want to become more involved in organic farming. So let's bring on Kai Hinson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kukua Market. 
good and see the truth and um, Dr. Yee for organizing this event. There's a very small pool of female farmers to draw from in Hawaii and nationwide. I think I looked up the ag census. The last one was in 2012 and there's only 30% of the uh, 2 million-ish farmers are women. So I'm really uh, grateful to be here and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, how I got into farming, uh, about our farm, and then about the farmers union. So I was a child here in Kailua, but I spent most of my life in California. I went to UC Santa Barbara and I didn't study ag, I studied global studies. And one thing that I was always passionate about was food and cooking. I loved food. It was a big part of my family and growing up was gathering around meals. And so I started to try to grow my own food in Santa Barbara and found out how hard it was. <laughs> So I started apprenticing under different farmers that were farming organically and nurserymen in Santa Barbara and spent my summers working on farms in Northern California. And when I graduated, I had a very uh, unique opportunity. My boyfriend's family, he, um, they have a, a piece of land here in Hawaii and they offered it to us to start our own farm. So we're in a very unique position that we own our land and especially here in Hawaii where land is extremely expensive, so we're very fortunate. Um, so when we got to Hawaii, similar to Allison's story, we didn't know if what was growing on our property was a weed or something we should cultivate and propagate, <laughs> so there was a major learning curve. And it was exciting in those first few months. We decided to do a permaculture design course, and we did it through the Asia Pacific Center for Regenerative Design. And anybody who is interested in gardening or consulting for people, they should definitely check out the Asia Pacific Center for Regenerative Design. They do a permaculture course that was amazing. We went around to all different farms on the island. I got to meet a lot of farmers who've been farming organically or biodynamically or beyond organically, we like to say, um, on the island. And it was amazing to grow that network and find people here with um, shared values. And so Green Rose Farm, um, this is my, Sean Anderson is my partner in crime and partner in farming over there. And he and I, um, through studying global studies, kept finding this connection back to food with political issues, economic issues, social issues, and environmental issues. And so when we started the farm, we wanted it to be a farm, but we also wanted it to be a community center that addressed a lot of those issues. So a few things that we do, we do educational events on the farm. We teach people about gardening. Um, we also teach people about food preservation and cooking and how to cook a lot of um, food that is all over the island, like ulu and taro that is growing wild and um, sometimes goes forgotten. The other thing we do, we do farm to table dinners. So bringing people to the farm, <laughs> preparing the food for them and getting them to try um, local organic food. We aren't certified organic, but we like to we like to cherry pick our practices from the best of the best. So we use Korean natural farming, um, some biodynamic principles, permaculture, and organic and we're really shooting for regenerative systems. So one thing that we saw that was happening was a lot of the stores here and nationwide food is getting thrown away. And so we pick up produce waste from Whole Foods four times a week and this, it's amazing what's in those cans sometimes. It's um, pretty wild what gets thrown away on the island. And we feed it to our chickens and that mitigates our feed costs. It closes that waste stream and we make a compost out of it that then goes on to the rest of the property. And, um, sorry, I'm really nervous. I'm not usually the one who's speaking in front of other people. It's definitely. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, beyond that, we got involved in policy as well. So working with the Farmers Union has been amazing. I think um, I heard a lot about Farm Bureau when I first moved here, whether I should or should join as a young female farmer. 
and I'm really glad that I became a member of the Farmers Union. It's a grassroots organization that's really um, out to support small farmers, small family farmers using regenerative practices, and that's really in their mission statement, um, which is cool. And I think that policy in Hawaii is a major issue, and that people need to be more active in their communities and getting, you know, people say, I want organic food, or I want more people to be growing this, or why can't I find this grown locally? And it's really interesting to be on that side of it now and talking to senators and representatives that they're really shocked when they come to the Farmers Union meetings. They didn't think there were farmers here. They didn't think that young people are interested in farming. And it really blows them away to come to a room full of people, just like tonight, that want the, that kind of food produced here in the island. And so I really want to encourage everybody to reach out to their representatives and get involved in their, you know, in this political system that we have going on here because they are here to listen. And all those doors of the Capitol are open every day for anybody who ever wants to go in or call. And um, it's really one of our missions this year is to increase our membership with uh, the Farmers Union because as soon as we're a chartered um, a state charter, so right now we don't have the amount of members that we need, but as soon as we are, that gives us a lot of clout. The National Farmers Union has been around for over 100 years, and so, um, you know, people in the Senate really listen when there's a big national organization behind a person standing in front of you telling, telling them that they want organic farming in Hawaii and they want regenerative farming in Hawaii. Um, Um, beyond that, uh, we do, um, oh, I do want to mention there's a, a sustainable ag forum that's coming up that we're partnering with Civil Beat and the Farmers Union at Green Rose Farm um, April 27th, and it's going to be a great event, just like tonight, talking about sustainable ag and the future for farming um, in Hawaii, so I wanted to mention that. Anyway, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you. so much, Kai. I, I really sympathize with you because when I first started talking publicly about six years ago, it was really an overwhelming experience, but it was like, hey, where, where is anybody else, you know? And I was the one who came forward and I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm learning, but I want to help educate other people. And so the more you do it, the more you feel comfortable with it. And so I'm definitely not a public speaker, but I really would encourage all of you to do it more because we need to hear the voices of the women. That's why we have this panel today. Um, we need to support the women in standing up and taking, taking out that voice to people uh, because we're, we're the nurturers, we're the, we're the mothers of the earth. And through us, we have a greater understanding of how politics should be run, how agriculture should be done, uh, what kind of food can nurture the children, so until we speak up, it's going to always be from the male point of view, and that is generally to exploit and to capitalize and to make money. And we're really having to change that now because it's a system that doesn't work. So uh, I'm glad we got a laugh out of that. But the guys here, you know, you have to support your women in standing up and becoming partners with you because until that happens, we're really heading down a very slippery slope, and it doesn't look good for America, especially. So I want to encourage all of you, guys and women, to come out publicly. I, you know, when I first started um, in Seeds of Truth, we had many people helping us out, and it was really wonderful to see, but little by little, they all kind of drifted away, and they got into farming, and now to ask them to come out and speak, it's like, I don't have time. You know, I have to take care of my farm. I have to go to the farmer's market. And so they're so busy with that aspect. But they were involved in the beginning and they saw how important it was for the educational um, reach, uh, outreach to the community. And that's why I continue to do this work. And I feel that it's really starting to pay off now because we're seeing in the legislature, even though we didn't get any bills passed this year, that there has never been greater receptivity to our message as women, 
as small farmers, as organic farmers. So I really do feel that our time is coming, and with regards to the GMO issue as well, people are taking us seriously now. You know, before it was just a bunch of crazy kids out there screaming their heads off, but now they realize GMOs and pesticides come together. And as long as they're out there, especially here in Hawaii, and they're being experimented on in open fields, we're running a great risk for our communities. And we have to change that. And I do believe the change is going to be coming in the next five years. So as long as we work together on this, we're going to see that uh, new group of people coming into the legislature in positions of power where we can really make that difference occur in our lifetime. Um, so anyway, thanks. Uh, talk about being outspoken. I really admire the next lady who's going to be speaking. Her name is, Kath, is Catherine Sheehan, and she uh, ran for, for Congress this past year. And she really spoke her mind. And when I saw her at Kapilani Park, I said, wow, this lady's hot. So I said, she's got to come to one of our panels and speak to us, because she's been working on, um, on a, a labor abuse for years. She's been talking about homelessness. She goes down the city council, holds signs, testifies, and is tireless in the work that she's doing. And these are the kind of women that we need. Uh, we have these other ladies here, too. But we have a woman like Catherine Sheehan who really, really will speak out for the disenfranchised people. So let's bring Catherine Sheehan up to the <laughs> front. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for Sea the Truth and Melissa for inviting me and having this awesome event. Uh, Y'all can call me Kathy. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to figure out the back of my mind how to convey what I want to convey without totally depressing the hell out of you. <laughs> it's really like a tough challenge, but um, I'll, tr I'll do my best. Um, I'm the executive director of the Pacific Alliance to Stop Slavery. We help houseless families with children as well as victims of human trafficking. Uh, and a lot of my work dealt with labor trafficking in the islands, which is still going on, very prevalent, hundreds upon hundreds of workers from all over the world come here to work and are exploited for their free or very cheap labor on many farms. Um, I went to a farmer's market on Thursday, and I was pretty upset because, I mean, we went there specifically to buy direct from farmers that are organic, that don't spray pesticides. Um, and we only found one, and she didn't even have a whole booth. She just had a small four-foot table. Um, and she does use pesticides. They're not synthetic pesticides. Um, and that was the only table that we had there at that whole farmer's market. And I've seen an influx of more and more farmers that are uh, either parading to be organic or not organic at all. Uh, when you ask them enough times, if you do spray pesticides, what kind of pesticides you spray, blah, 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 uh, they start getting a little bit more sketchy in their responses. And as somebody who's worked directly with labor traffic victims, some of whom have died from the application of pesticides on farms, I know exactly how they die, what it does to you, um, how long it takes for you to develop cancer uh, or other serious illnesses. Uh, it's not a pretty experience to witness, uh, it's fairly traumatic. And I do everything that I can to, uh, though I can't publicize the bad farms that are doing these things, that are doing these practices, that are exploiting and literally killing these people, but not only them, but the land, the air, the water system, as well as the consumers who buy the product. Um, I can publicize those good farms that are doing great work that are not being exploitative to land, water, or people. Um, and that's the best that I can do, unfortunately, because uh, our system um, is broken. And uh, it's very difficult to move change through either the legislature or through policy, uh, through the agriculture system. Uh, it's, it's challenging. Um, so what do I do in response? to the throwing out of a case uh, with Aloon Farms and Global Horizons that were uh, the largest cases of labor trafficking um, 
that the U.S. has seen in recent times with prejudice, so that means they can't bring that those cases again. They have to start all over with new victims. Um, what do you do in light of that? Uh, well, for one thing, it's taught everybody who's an exploited worker in this country and other countries, because they were watching, that the bad guys win. That if you ask for help, if you get the help of the FBI, uh, the Department of Justice, you're going to fail anyway. What that did was create a sharecropping scheme with the existing victims unable to get any sort of help other than get a green card. What do they do for work? They go back into this broken, corrupt system to make a living. And they get re-exploited. And they are being re-exploited. And they're literally dying of exposure to restricted-use pesticides. Which, mind you, it's an illegal use of restricted-use pesticides. There's a black market for these things. Um, I know because I confiscated two gallons of it these uh, restricted-use pesticides, per permethrin and Vidate. And I'm just waiting for the Cliff Suji hearing where I can tell him and show him that exactly what is going on with these black market restricted-use pesticides that hundreds of farms across the state are using it on crops illegally without diluting them and without washing them at all. Some farms who are licensed to use these restricted-use pesticides have to wash them three times. Well, the illegals don't at all. And this goes to the market, to your restaurants. So when we start thinking about local farming, we really have to do more to discern, well, what does that local farming entail? There are good guys, and there are a lot of bad guys. We need to think of local farming as Pono farming first, because if we just lump everybody together in this label, broad label of buy local, well, you're contributing to a broken system that exploits people, kills people, and poisons your families. So, <laughs> y'all depressed? <laughs> okay. So, some of the things that I do personally to, um, I guess, balance the heaviness of this reality and to, uh, I guess, uh, um, reify my faith in humanity <laughs> is there's small things. Um, I started an organic garden at St. Andrew's Cathedral in the back of Davies Hall uh, on Queen Emma Square. It's the only church that was actually invited to the islands by the Hawaiian monarchy. It started by Queen Emma and King Kamehameha IV. Very sacred land to me as a Christian and somebody who loves the Hawaiian people and loves this land, we took that plot of dirt, basically, and created an organic garden which anybody can tend. The only rule is no pesticides, obviously, and uh, no uprooting things without permission. But basically, anyone can go there and plant and harvest at will. It was made for the people, it was our contribution. Uh, it was the will of Queen Emma to do that kind of work. And as the chair of the social justice ministry at St. Andrews, that was the first thing that I, I did when I took the chairship there. So please go and visit. You know, you can go there anytime. It's a very special place. You can feel the mana uh, around that area where there were just two trees and just pretty much spots, splotches of grass. Uh, we transformed it and are transforming it. We are hoping to transform the entire 10,000 square foot area into a food forest, which is going to be challenging. But you can use it. It's there for you. The other thing I did uh, as, as the executive director of the Pacific Alliance to Stop Slavery is start uh, a subsidiary fundraising arm of this nonprofit organization that helps the homeless and human trafficking survivors called Pono Soap. We sell organic, uh, mostly vegan, ethically sourced, and ethically made soaps and salves and laundry detergents, completely chemical free. As you may or may not know, there is a lot of noxious chemicals that consumer store-bought uh, beauty products and soap products have in them uh, to preserve them. Uh, it's really gnarly. I suggest that you actually Google detergent or soap, SLS, SLE acids. It reminds me of the kind of pesticides that they use on the ground level for Whole Foods. Not the market, but just your whole foods that you grow on the farm. 
Um, so there's a lot of, really I believe that this, this battle, this struggle, is a defining struggle for humanity. It's really a struggle between good and evil. And on the good aspect, the only positive aspect of this is that it urges us to come out of our shells and really define our identity, where we stand in this issue. If we're gonna just sit by and let it go by us, wait for it, our children or our grandchildren to take up the torch, or are we just really gonna do something now? Uh, because really it's critical, and we are at some point going to be forced to take a stand on this, because we live on an island, you know, and we're running out of water. California is gonna run out of water in about a year. Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona are quickly behind, and Nevada. It's going to be an issue here in Hawaii, especially on this island, when our largest aquifer out by uh, Pearl Harbor is depleted about 60%. And uh, more and more development happens in Kaka'ako and Waikiki without regard to how we're gonna replenish the aquifers here. So really, what that's going to do is it's going to call to us to take a stand. Now or later, if we do it now, we might be able to reverse these trends. We might be able to mend and heal the broken system and really come together as a community. Uh, or if we wait till it's too late, well, I hate to imagine what that would look like. Um, so really, the change happens and it's all within our grasp. It's in our hands to be able to do something now, even in the slightest, and the thing is, that you never know that the slightest thing that you can do can actually end up in something huge later down, on down the line. So don't give up that opportunity to actually affect that change. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, you know, I was talking to Gigi Kokio, who's out in Makaha, and he was sharing with us that um, when 9-11 happened, he was so dejected and so depressed that the only thing he found that he could do was go out in the garden and start working. Because when you think about all the things that are happening in the world, you become impotent, or you think you become impotent and unable to make any kind of difference. But in fact, you have your hands, you have your mind, you have your voice. And so if all of us were to start doing a little victory garden in our backyard, it brings so much satisfaction to see the bees coming around, see the butterflies flying around. It changes your whole attitude. Instead of thinking, you know, we're doomed, there's nothing we can do about it. When you start to grow that little plant in your backyard, you have a different attitude toward life and how you eat your food, whether you appreciate it or whether you're just gonna to continue to buy it from the supermarket. When you create your own food, it tastes better. And when it's organic, it's just the best. So, thanks all for coming again. And our last speaker today is um, Juanita Kaumoto Brown. She was one of the first people I had to come speak on a panel. And at that time, I didn't quite know who she was, but over the years I've come to recognize that she's a very powerful leader in the community, especially in the Democratic Party. So she's now the head of the Environmental Caucus, and she's going to share a little bit about her engagement in the state legislature. Juanita? Thank you, Melissa, for inviting me again. I, whenever I see you email me or call me, I immediately go, okay, she's going to ask me to say something <laughs> one more time. And I never grow tired of answering her with a big fat yes, because we cannot stop here. As all these wonderful young women who I have great pride in right now to tell you that they're the future. You know, that is our future. That's one of the questions Melissa asked us to think about was what is our future? You know, what are we gonna be looking at tomorrow? And as a mother and a grandmother, a kupuna, and with a large, large ohana, with a genealogy that goes back to 1,354 that we've been able to track just amongst ourselves as Maoli Hawaiian, I have to tell you, to see what we're facing today, 
is one of the most positive experiences I've ever had in my whole life. And I've had many, many good experiences. I have Ohana, I have loved ones, we've had a lot of good things happen here in our state, and Hawaiine is still standing. So, what I want to get into at this point, what I can add and that I'd like to share is when I began this process back in 2010 about looking at what it meant to make a difference to help one small farm out in Ko'olau Loa, Maili Moa Egg Farm, one of the last four commercial egg farms in 2010 that raised their own chickens and created uh, the ability for their ohana to have a business and provide fresh local eggs. I started also to learn that there were problems happening within the government that we couldn't get out there and save this farm was now telling me they were gonna go bankrupt because they couldn't afford the cost to continue to do the things they were doing. And one of the biggest costs that impacts small livestock farms here in our state is feed. If you can believe that, we import our feed, and most of the feed that we import is GMO feed, which was another shock to me as I started to learn the process. And I told my friend, I said, you folks cannot close. We don't have enough local fresh eggs. And, and we need your farm to continue. And their farm had been around for over 25 years. And yet, you know, they still couldn't compete with all of the import that was coming across the water. And so it was because of feed that was the biggest cost. And I thought, you know, I grew up with a large ohana that spread out on Maui, Kauai, Hawaii Island, and Oahu. And all of them had varieties of sustainable farming, fishing, fish ponds, hunting as hunters in forests. And they all were able to take care of our ohana without having to go ahead and import feed. So it behooved me to go and ask, why are we only stuck having to import when we have enough things here to feed the small livestock. And that's all the compost things that we normally throw away. All the different things, that's what my tutu would do. She would use all this wonderful, what we call organic to her, that's just sustainable living. We didn't have the money or the capacity to go out and buy expensive ground up pesticides. Thank God. You know, we did it the old fashioned way. We used the materials and the resources that were naturally in our ac access for us, and that's how she was able to grow the food and raise the chickens and raise the pigs and take care of my whole ohana. And my mother's family had 11 children in Kihei, Maui, where at that time, it wasn't as desert as it is today. But even in those kinds of conditions, we were able to sustain enough to feed large family that lived out there. So when I went back to that commercial farmer and said, what's the matter? She's saying, they just keep, you know, this is the system here. This is how we have to get things done, Nina. I don't have a choice. You know, for the size of farm, the FDA, all these rules and regulations, all these laws that are out there that are created not only by our state, but by other states federally that prohibit a lot of things that my kupuna could feed us on and raise us on and still exists today. So I decided, okay, who we got to talk to to make the change happen? Oh, we got to go down to the state capitol is what I got told. I got a call one night from a good friend of mine, Snita, they're gonna have this meeting with the Democratic Party of Hawaii. They're starting an environmental caucus. None had ever existed prior to this. We had a labor caucus and a women's caucus. All these different issues were just incorporated into different things, but 
this very small group of people decided it is time, especially when they started to face so many issues about creating food sustainability and helping small family farms continue to continue to prosper and thrive in our state, to buy local and buy fresh. So I said, okay, let's go check this out. Who was there? Our famous friend now, former Senator Gary Hooser, was at the top of the list. He was the first man to open this caucus for us. There were others that were from various areas of the environmental community, from the Sierra Club, former Sierra, and, and current Sierra Club people, people who were working for the Department of Land and Natural Resources in the forest, where the hunters and the fishermen go back and forth to try and find ways to continue to practice and, and with permit and reason and balance come out and do the things they want to do. All these fantastic people were there and here comes Nita, no experience, very little political intrigue at all, none at all, in fact. The only thing that I had done politically since I was 18 years old because my Ohana made sure I did it was vote. And even when I voted, it wasn't always um, with full understanding of who am I voting for. If my Ohana said, vote for this person because he's always been there, he does all these things for our community. Okay, fine, I'll go that way because he seems like a nice guy. Okay. So I start to talk to my friends there that I meet for the first time and um, immediately liked where they were coming from. I said, I'm gonna tell you, I'm here because I'm kind of being selfish. And my selfish is because there's a small farm in, in Maili who's gonna go bankrupt. And they're telling me they cannot afford the cost of feed. How come we don't have local feed mills? How come we don't make our own feed? I know my kupuna used to make their own feed and we could feed a lot of people. I knew Hawaiians fed one million Hawaiians and there were no import feed then either. So the answer came back, well, we don't know. Maybe you should go ask. And so this way of people said, will you help us with food and farm sustainability? I said, okay, tell me what I gotta do. So they guided me and gave me information I signed up, which I thought I was always a Democrat, but apparently you have to sign up and become one. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta fill out a form and say, I have a card carrying Democrat. And I said, okay, now what? And the next thing is, okay, we need to make resolutions and we need to create bills. What the heck is that? No, and the answer was, well, this is the way that you go ahead and we take it down to the legislature and then the legislators, the elected officials, will then sit there and it'll go before committees and the committees will go ahead and make decisions and then you will have a resolution or a bill. And I go, wow, really? That's all I gotta do? Okay, I'm gonna go for it. All right, boy, five, six years later, I'm gonna tell you it was not that simple. And it is not that simple, but I'm a very, what Hawaiians say, po'opakiki person. Very hard-headed. So I'm very stubborn, and I knew that by getting out there and helping our community address something as simple as, can we please help save our local sustainable small farms? They are so important to this community. They are so healthy for where we're coming from, and they're my ohana. We need to take care of them. So from that moment in November 2010, I would spend every waking moment, and my husband, Mr. Brown over there, sitting in the room, he's one of, women can only be what we are because good people stand behind us and support us. So, aloha. <laughs> take us down there, we're going to have to talk to these people. And, and he stood by me, along with many friends and family, to start to question, why? Why? What are we going to do? And then we started making appointments, and oh my God, when you go down, you first you go through this process with the party. 
you have to go ahead and create a resolution. You create this resolution, you have to convince this small group, our caucus of 300 people. We want to go ahead and tell the people through the Democratic Party of Hawaii and our members, please support this. See, please support the, the production and the, the growth and the building of a small local feed mill in Hawaii. And I was surprised. The, the caucus immediately said yes. At that time, I think we only had like maybe 50 people. And then it became where we took it to our county, which is then we're talking about seven, 8,000 people at that point. And we did a good job presenting there. And they are all the local people, just like you and me. And they said, yep, yeah, we're supporting. We didn't know we didn't have a local feed mill. So definitely, if it's going to help small farms, we can do this. So now, that got passed. And then we had a state convention. All of this happened in a period of one and a half years. One and a half years it only took. I was lucky. I was at the timing where I could actually do it. Typically, it might take two or three years to get it going. But I had a lot of support and a lot of aloha to share with lots of people out there. And they listened to us. They did. And so we moved it forward to our state convention, and 65,000 Democrats were represented, and they voted for local feed mill. So when we took that that year, after we got that done to the state capitol, it really made people's eyes open. I didn't come as one person. I didn't even come as a few. I came with a power of a party that was there that can make a difference because most of those elected officials were Democrats. And so the ones that sit in those seats where they're committee heads, they are Democrats. Most of them are. So when we say the party, they're all staring at me going, are you kidding me? The Democratic Party told you this? And I'm going, yes. The Democratic, and they have to go check. Are you sure you can talk for the Democratic Party of Hawaii? Yes, I can. Yes, I can, because all the people who supported this said we could. So from that point forward, we finally got a bill passed where they are working today and funding small local feed mill. And not just and we're specifying. We would really appreciate that you set up this system for organic feed. Yeah. Okay. Not just, you know, you gotta go back and forth, but they understood the momentum and the motive of we need organic feed because it's all about that. So I have great hope for the Farmers Union United. I remember the day they came to the Capitol, way back, four years ago, not that far back, and they showed up, and guess who was one of the first people we had to go and try and sit down to be heard? To even say, here is the Farmers Union United. You don't only have the Hawaii Farm Bureau Federation. There is another one that's focused on organic farms, local small family farming. The people that we got to sit there and ask for permission to speak was Senator Clarence Nishihara mm -hmm. and Representative Cliff Suji. Yeah, and if you can believe this, this is exactly what happened. This was Senator Nishihara's first year in. He had not been introduced to almost anything. Now, if you know Senator Nishihara's background, he was a former principal at one of the schools here in his district. The interesting thing was, at that time, I had gotten to meet him because of former Senator Gary Husser. Gary and Mr. Nishihara were good friends in the past. And he <laughs> went and talked to Mr. Nishihara on our behalf to see if we could please be on the agenda to open that legislative session with the newly formed Farm Bureau, Farmers Union United. And then Senator Nishihara said, yes, 
you can be heard. And Representative Suji said, no, we don't want to have them come in. They're not organized enough for us to, but Senator Nishihara stood by that. He had already promised, believe this, this was before where Senator is today. You know, so there's hope for some. Unfortunately, <laughs> some of the other guys get to them before we can, you know, is what I'm trying to say. And, and it isn't that I'm going to tell you that they're all bad or they're all good. I've learned over the years of being there. I used to be very angry at them because I used to think, these elected officials, they don't care about us. All I care about is, you know, they're getting their payoffs or what have you that's going on. In fact, when you look at what they have to weigh, it is a difficult choice and it isn't always about money. When you look at Senator Nishihara's district, he has a lot of farmers that work for Monsanto. This is a job issue. I am not a big supporter of that corporation. I am proud to say that to everybody. But it's hard to get them out if we don't have a solution to put something better in. And that's another thing I learned going through this process. If we want to see things happen, please think about what's the solution. Go out there and come up with these ideas that all of us can do together. Stay close to your community. Listen to all the different things people have to say because you know what's right for us. Even more so than some of our elected officials because they have to take the weight of having to balance one versus the other. But the one thing that always succeeds is people power. And like my friend Catherine was saying earlier, it's tough, it's hard when you have to deal, it can get really depressing and negative. But the one thing that makes me proud every time is I have never lost faith in the people of Hawaii. We are unique, we are special, we are trailblazers, we are innovators. All of us know we can make a difference. Because I see it every day when I open up a newspaper, I listen to my friends tell me, we made it. Something else has moved forward to help the people. Just support people power. And how you do that is make a difference by please registering to vote. Please get involved in community groups. Share your mana'o with them. Don't ever feel like you're not saying the right thing at the right time or it's uncomfortable. It's never like that. Just speak with your heart and we will succeed. So I have a positive attitude and will continue that till my last breath, that I have faith in all the people in this room and all the people who live in the state of Hawaii. So mahalo for your time. Uh, I remember a time when I went down to the neighborhood board meeting in Makiki, and that was my first opportunity to meet Doug Matsuoka, who <laughs> was filming it. And uh, he was there because of all the young kids down at uh, Thomas Square. And uh, I got up and I started talking about GMO. And um, I didn't know what I was getting into, but it was being filmed by Olelo, and that was my first foray into public speaking. And uh, it took about three or four months before um, a representative from Pioneer, um, Cindy Goldstein, came to retort some of the things I had said. But by that time, the board had become so educated about GMO that when she got up and started talking about labeling potato chips and she brought in some uh, food from Whole Foods and was going on and on about how Pioneer was contributing to, um, to the community, Everybody saw through it. And somebody whispered off to the side, she's so fake. <laughs> and uh, that really was something that touched me very deeply because I saw that at the neighborhood board level, you really can make a difference. And so I'm encouraged that Roger is here today. And even though we think that, oh, who wants to go to neighborhood board meeting? That's actually where people start to become educated. And so in having that experience, um, you move on to the city council, to the state legislature, and you even start considering running for office. And I think there are some people here in this room who are actually very qualified to become 
um, new politicians, the new politicians, who will actually do good for our community. So I don't think you should say, no, I'll never do it, because many times you'll see a surprise winner. And I do believe that in the next 10 years, we're gonna see more young people coming forward, people with no political background, who are just doing it because they really care about their community, and they will win, and that's how the system will change. So I have faith that it is gonna turn around. Um, but you are the ones who are gonna to have to get on the boat, as Juanita said. You're gonna to have to talk to your neighbors, you're gonna to have to go to some of these meetings, and you're really gonna to have to learn about the issues. And uh, I think from today's panel that we can see that there's great hope for the future. And so I do believe that in about two or three election cycles, we will see enough good people in the legislature and the city council that we will be able to make those changes that we need so that Hawaii can start growing its own food. So that ends our panel. We actually have some time left. So I'd like to ask any of you who have a question for our panelists to stand forward. And we only have this one microphone, so you need to come up to the front here, identify yourself, and ask your question. And um, we'll have some closing remarks from all of the ladies at the end. Anybody? with you a long time about, about about joining this evening and I hadn't followed up but I did get to come out and I missed our first panelist so I think my question would be to ask for a summary and ask for um, what you heard from your fellow panel members that really resonated with you that you'd like to hear um, be spread and shared out because next week there is a panel that the North Shore Outdoor Circle is putting on out on the North Shore um, Celestial Natural Food, the natural food out there is sponsoring that, so it's similar timing and similar theme. Um, and I'll be joining that panel, and I want to make sure that you know, the messages that were put out tonight, those get a chance to get out to the other side of the island where some of these agricultural issues are a little more in your face and tangible. Um, so I guess that would be my question. Does anybody have any specific questions before we do a summary? I know a lot of you won't want to come up to the mic, and I don't want to force you guys up here. <laughs> so if you just want us to ask your question, that's cool. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, and this is directed, well, um, th this uh, panel was specifically about uh, uh, women in uh, agriculture, farming, and that sort of thing. I'd like to ask if there are any typical, not necessarily absolute, but typical differences in the way, in the women's attitude toward farming than men. And, and I'd like to direct that question to all of you except Melissa. No, I'm kidding. I, <laughs> uh, so the question that Doug is posing is, are there any differences between the way women farm as opposed to men? Right. Basically, yeah. So, if any of you would like to come up here and answer, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure if there's. I, I share values with my partner, um, but what I will say is, outsiders that come to our farm, um, they'll come and say, "Hi, I'm so and so. Uh, can I speak to the farmer?" Or can I speak to the person in charge? And I always take, um, you know, I'm not offended, but I love it because I actually, when we started our business together, I had more farming experience and more business experience than my boyfriend did. Still. <laughs> <laughs> Still do. He hasn't come. Um, and so that is definitely um, an issue, I think, that a lot of um, women face in business, not just in farming. Um, I did want to take a moment to say that the insect, or, or talking about feed, feed on the island was brought up right at the end. And um, one thing that we're doing at Green Rose is we've partnered with UH to research um, insect farming for feed production for the islands and looking at black soldier fly and the potential there. And what we've done is, you know, those they feed on waste, and it's different from a housefly. They create a larva that is 
very high in protein and fats. Um, that's a great food source. And to feed the larva, we're picking up um, spent grain from local breweries and using that as um, our medium. And it's going really great. And it's just another example of things that are going to waste on the island being um, upcycled and turned into something that is a valuable resource that we really need. So I just wanted to pull that on. I have another question. Can I ask a quick another question? Um, uh, we need to mention that uh, in uh, pre-Cook uh, uh, Hawaii, that Hawaii fed uh, maybe up to a million people, and obviously without importing any food, where we now import, I guess, 90% of the food. Has there been any, um, is there any estimate on how much we could actually produce with the ag land that we have and with uh, you know maybe new techniques and perma blitzing and vertical farming and that sort of thing. So the question was uh, basically um, how much production can we eventually get compared to how we were able to feed uh, the indigenous people, the Hawaiian people were able to feed themselves with a million people uh, compared to now where we're importing ninety percent of our food. answer is an ongoing thought, okay? And the answer is based on the fact that um, government needs to fund back the things that used to happen in the Department of Agriculture, where we used to have a thing called statistics. There was a department there that specifically checked out how much are we growing, what are we doing to help it move forward? How are we going to expand it? It actually created the means for farmers to create business planning, you know, so that they could know how much of a crop should they be looking at this year in comparison to everybody going to grow cucumbers because that's the thing to grow right now and it grows the easiest? Or are we going to diversify, which is really what the potential is? So answer to you is the ongoing thought is if we go out and we keep recommending to this, to our government that we need to put these things back in play to give the farmers the tools they need, yes, we can feed a million people because the resource hasn't changed that much. You know, yes, we've seen a lot of our land being eaten up by development. That has definitely changed. And the method of farming that we've used back then in comparison to now has changed. Because the million people, Kokua, they didn't just sit down and say, go make the food for me and I'm gonna get what I want to, to eat because I'll just go grocery store and get what I want. Those million people practice ahupua'a. They practice the ways that we all can contribute. You know, we can all be a part of this. We do urban farming, there's so much some things happening today because of young people like this that bring them from all over the world to show us. You can use black soldier flies to feed the chickens now and they'll have a way better resource and a healthier product for us to enjoy. It's just this recycling, which was again part of the ahupua. So it is my understanding from very good sources in our Department of Agriculture that I've trusted for the past five years that have shared with me. We have the potential to go there, but all of the people have to get together and push for tools to get done. Great, thank you. there a difference between female farmers and male farmers now. I know for a fact, because I've you know, worked with a lot of labor traffic victims, as I said, um, a lot of these farmers are women too. They're just not registered with any sort of like organization to be counted. And I will have to say that being a jerk knows no gender 
some of these women who have these exploitative farms do horrible things just as, you know, really detached male farmers uh, who exploit the land legally <laughs> for profit do. I mean, it's, a, it's really just a, you know, it's a human flaw uh, for people who are greedy to want to just exploit the land and um, each other. So. Thank you. So if you can come to the front here and ask a question. I think it's really interesting that uh, I talked to some people who were at the farmers markets and they were saying that whenever you have a night market, it ends up being not selling produce. It's just fast food. People want to go there to eat their dinner, but they don't want to buy the fruits and vegetables to, make, to take home and make on their own. So we're really becoming a society of convenience as long as we have this attitude that somebody else is going to make it for us. Uh, we've got to change that. We've got to start growing our own, and we've got to start cooking our own. Because when you think about the ingredients in the food that you're eating in the restaurants and cafes, it's not healthy. And inevitably, your body's going to suffer. So you must grow your own. You must cook your own. Um, I would just like to thank um, everyone who's organized this, because this was like, I just moved here from New York doing a lot of the same work, and I just moved here in February. So this is like very close to my heart, and it makes me feel so at home. So thank you guys very much. Um, I had a couple of questions just going through what, what you guys were saying, and I would guess I would start with Penny, and I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, when you said that they're creating bees to, to fight off the beetle, what did you mean by that exactly? They're just, like anything genetic, they're creating a stronger bee. We're working to create a stronger bee, just like we did with humanity. <coughs> anyway, they're trying to create a stronger bee. So it's like anything with your breeding process. You're going to take the best of the best, and you're going to breed them, and you're going to get a stronger bee that's going to be able to tolerate this, this environment that's been created for them, that they're trying to fight against. These vests that we're getting in here are not from the United States. It's something everybody needs to understand. The Varroa and well, the small hive beetle came from Africa. They've got African bees. They can beat them up. They don't care. You know, <laughs> African bees come at you, they kill you. They don't just stop. They don't sting you once and lose their fingers. Every one of those in the hive, 80,000 bees come and kill you. In Texas, they had that happen. This lady had her boyfriend and her, and they had small ponies. The bees stayed over, the pony jumped in a pool. They stayed over that pony and stung it and stung it and stung it until it killed it. The people got stung over 100, well, I think the wife got like, like 300 stings, the boyfriend got like 100. They almost died. So those are the kind of things, these small hive beetles came from Africa. They have no competition here. So our little bees are like, oh my god, but they're learning. And by being able to do this, taking these other stronger bees and moving them in, breeding them like that, then we're going to have ones that can fight it. Got it. Thank you. Um, and also, Allison, you were talking about um, keeping your the, the food that you guys create. It's only like a small market. How, how come it's not able to maybe go to schools or hotels or other industries around your area? Policy or like, what are some of the why? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So it's not that it can't go to other places. Um, basically, when Bart and I started working at Puahoku about a year and a half ago, there really wasn't a farm. Um, there was like a very small garden. Where the farm is located is about an hour from the major population on Molokai. Molokai has a population of about 8,500 people, and I think about 7,500 people live in one major town on the island and we're about an hour away from there. So there's actually only one really small hotel. There's not a lot of markets on Molokai. So we could sell um, at some grocery stores and things like that. And we, we do a little bit in small kind of informal ways, but primarily we found that the best way to actually get our food out into the community of Molokai is um, through the farmer's market. And we have partnered up with Food Corps on Molokai, um, so 
via Sustainable Molokai, who's their host site, and they have a food hub project going on, which is specifically to kind of you know, create a food hub and get food out to the community, and so we work with them in small ways. So we actually have sold food um, to one elementary school through Sustainable Molokai. Selling local produce to schools is like a whole other big giant thing that just takes a long time. So I would say that, you know, one, the markets on Molokai are pretty small and limited. They're also fairly informal, too. The econ economy on Molokai has a lot of, like, informal components. Um, and getting food into places, institutions like schools, is just a really big beast that in a year and a half, not there just yet. Um, but I do have a lot of hope for it, specifically um, via sustainable Molokai and a lot of good work that's going on. You said that there was an inst uh, some kind of institution if you would like to know more about uh, permaculture. I didn't quite get that. Maybe if it's you were. Long. Okay, yeah. It's, uh, the Asia Pacific Center for Regenerative Design. Asia? Asia okay. Pacific Center okay. for Regenerative Design. For Regenerative Design. I have part of that. And um, th there was an event that you were talking about as well. Yeah, on April 27th with Civil Beat at Green Rose Farm. Civil Beat? Yeah. Okay. Kathy, you do you talk St. Andrews? That's on this island, right? <laughs> I was just kind of like Molokai. Okay. okay. And um, Juanita, what? Um, how? Where? How do you get involved with the neighborhood board meetings and like that whole pyramid level? Like, where? How do you get involved? Like, where? <laughs> so, and these are all like questions maybe that I can just. Real quick, you can get on your iPad and Google Hawaii Neighborhood Board. And what will happen is the city and county website will open up. And then you go ahead and you put in your address where you live. And it will tell you right where you got to go for the district you belong in. Thank you, ladies, very much. <laughs> Thank you. to remind people that on April 15 will be an Ag Day down at the state legislature. So I believe the Farmers Union will be represented as well. Before it used to only be the Farm Bureau. That's right. Unfortunately, because of the work of all these people that uh, were able to have representation from both sides. Um, and so that event you mentioned was April 27. Um, that is being sponsored by Green Rose Farm. Out of your farm? Yeah. Yeah, so if you go to um, Green, Green Rose Farm, uh, they have a website and you can get that information about when the event is going to be. Yes, if you have any other questions, please come up to the front here and just have a, have a wait. Anybody else? Hi, my name's Ale. Thank you guys all so much. It's been a great panel. Um, I have actually two questions for Kathy. Um, you said something about not being able to disclose names of the bad guys, and I was kind of wondering um, just your opinion about transparency and different kinds of things like that within our local food system. And then I get constantly asked um, local versus organic, and I kind of have my answer that I give, but I'd like to hear uh, what you say to people, because it's a what's big... Your, what's your answer? <laughs> Um, well, I come from San Francisco and slow food. I've been out here about eight years, so we always said organic first and then local. And now it's kind of shifted to local first and then organic. And then specifically in Hawaii, I feel like we say local first. So, um, yeah, I'd just love to hear it. Yeah, been, okay, awesome. I'm really glad you asked that question that I totally forgot the first one. But, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a, I, you know, I hate to be a downer because there's so many really great farmers out there. Um, but local first is really problematic. It's so problematic. If you knew what these people are doing to, to their workers and the land through the uh, unlicensed use of restricted use pesticides, you would freak out. I promise you. Uh, we need to encourage the discussion. I'm from the North Shore, by the way. 
So I grew up on a beach right across from where several of these farms are doing their thing. And it just really upsets me. Because 20 years ago, they weren't there. You know, they've been allowed through the inefficacy of, with all due respect, if there is any, the, the inefficacy of the Department of Agriculture, the way that the laws are structured, it makes it impossible for the Department of Agriculture to actually investigate properly offenses of uh, unlicensed use of restricted use pesticides, exploitation of farm workers, working with other agencies on the state level to get justice. It's impossible. So they will be actually set up to fail and when you look at their records of what the complaints are, you see case closed, no violation committed. When in actuality, there are violations committed, they're just not investigating them properly. For example, you make a, a complaint about legal uses of pesticides on farms, they will call the farmer up and one of their options for investigation is, hey, can you guys come in uh, to our offices and show paperwork that you guys aren't using restricted use pesticides? That's a, that's a true story. And so they'll close the case file, and the complainant will look like they're, they're out of their mind or they were erroneous. And the farmer, the farm, will look completely innocent. That's a really big problem. So we need to further the discussion statewide about what local farming actually means. Because there are farms here, let me tell you, there are farms here that are doing just as bad things as the farms on the mainland. There is one farm that we were responsible, my agency was responsible for getting a, a, a verdict against them through the US Department of Labor in the amount of $460,000 in reparations due to the workers. It was Fat Law Farm, but they're the largest basil exporter in the state. A few years prior to that, they were cited for using an illegal pesticide on their basil and they were ordered to burn the entire crop and were fined. Okay. If you look at the order that was rendered against them by the U.S. Department of Labor, you will see elements of human trafficking throughout that entire order that they are not supposed to do. The only, and these, this is the farm that we complain against, first on the state level with the Department of Agriculture. What did the Department of Agriculture find? No violation occurred. Yet the U.S. Department of Labor busted them for a whole list of violations. What does the, uh, the State Department of Agriculture do? give them high marks for abiding by the law and you know, doing a good job agriculturally. So we need to further that discussion of what is local. Is it harmful? Is it pono? And we really have to switch that paradigm to what, the, what you do in the Bay Area, what you see in the Bay Area, which is organic first and then local. Thank you. It has to be a discussion. What I like to do when I'm shopping at other farmers markets that are, is not the one I'm at is I ask. And I tell people all the time, ask. And it's true, I mean, Kathy shared some stories about people not being super transparent and I, and I that makes me really sad as a farmer because that's one thing that we're all about. Um, all farmers markets are not equal. They're all run by different on the island, they're, they're for-profit businesses, so the farmers are paying to be there. Um, so if you go to a market on Saturday, you know, you go to the one on Sunday, they're run by different people. There's different rules for being at those markets. There's different, um, you know, things that you have to be a part of the Farm Bureau markets, you also have to be a Farm Bureau member. So there's different things that you have to do for each of those markets. At our market, we pay a stall fee every week. And I'd like to really plug the um, Farm Lovers uh, LLC because they are responsible for a few of the markets that are happening around the island. And they are committed, you know, it's everyone who's there is an organic, um, but they're all transparent. And one part of, um, getting into those markets is that the people who run it do a site visit. And they actually come to the farm and they make sure that the practices you're, you're telling them you're using are the ones uh, that, there are, that they are using, to an extent. I mean, I, I think that everyone at the market that we go to Sunday at Kailua Elementary School, you know, I hear people say, no, we, we use pesticides, or we, we 
don't spray, but we use chemical fertilizers. Or um, these are the products that are grown organically at our farm, and these are not. And there is that conversation, and it's really exciting because when people start asking for those things, farmers right. say, oh, maybe I should be growing that. And it's really, I really encourage everybody to have that discussion um, because if you're asking for it, believe me, it will be delivered because I think people just um, want to meet that demand anyway. Um, there's something else that's to say. Anyway. Thank you. I, I, I have a question for you. How can the general public find, uh, on, possibly on the internet, this Farm Owners uh, LLC and other uh, other organizations that are promoting the uh, organic food? Um, so Farm Owners has a great website. You can check it out, and it tells you where all their markets are. The other. Um, um, there's a Slow Food Hawaii website that is great. I think, you know, I did want, I remember what I want to say now, which is to support the Hawaii Farmers Union United because right now at the ledge, there's only one group that's representing ag at the table, and that's uh, the Farm Bureau, and that's big corporate ag, and that's a lot, that's the farms that are spraying pesticides, and there are a lot of you know, people that don't live here that manage those farms and come from the outside and, you know, they don't take care of the land and they don't take care of the people. And I think that when you have a small family farm here in Hawaii, it really, you know, the people that I meet at our farmers union meetings and across the islands, because it's an island-wide organization, they all have families. They're bringing their kids to the potluck. They're we're talking about, you know, all of these issues at these meetings, and they care. I mean, they, they are caring about getting young farmers on land. They're caring about using Kono practices, getting pesticides out of ag in Hawaii. I mean, they're all dedicated, real people that care about their communities and are growing food because they feel that that's their way to give back and make change. <coughs> um, so I really encourage everybody to reach out to the Hawaii Farmers Union on whatever island you're on or here. And you don't have to be a farmer to be a part of it. In fact, we need people that aren't farmers because uh, like Melissa said, you know, far it's hard to get farmers off their land and into town and in at the ledge. It's, it's really difficult. And we need lawyers and doctors and activists and anybody who cares and is passionate about these things because um, we, we're a whole community of different people that I've, everybody has something to bring to this discussion. So, thank you. So that's the Hawaii Farmers Union, and uh, there's also the Hawaii Organic Farming Association, which I'm a member of. And if you can join those, even though you're not a farmer, to support those people who are working to bring food to you here in Hawaii that is organic and local and free of pesticides. So um, you can check out our Facebook page, it's called Seeds of Truth. And um, I'm going to uh, give time for two more questions, and then we will have each of the uh, panelists give a little summary about, uh, okay, three people. <laughs> Come up right, right away. So the, the lament that is expressed by people that are farming or would aspire to be farmers is that they face all these obstacles in Hawaii, you know, like land access, financing, water, and also there are the political and economic realities that they have to deal with. You two have been lucky to have access to land, but I was wondering, from your experience here in Hawaii and your conversations with other farmers, what are some of the specific things that you've had to deal with and what could be done to make the farming experience easier for you here? And might you contrast what you faced here with what you faced in Massachusetts and California? In my experience, the one of, I don't know if it's the number one, but definitely up there, challenges with, 
you know, at least my generation farming or, or starting a farm is 100% access to land. You know, I'm from an area of Massachusetts that very much like Hawaii, land is very expensive. It has some of the, you know, highest real estate values in the U.S. And other than um, Bart, my partner who just left, whose family farm has been in his family for a really, really long time and uh, is, a, is a working family farm, pretty much, you know, all of my generation of farmers back home, it's 100% inherited land. And those are the only people that can afford to start a farm. Or they're leasing land and you know they're never gonna own that or, or whatever, you know, some other really unappealing thing. That's a huge problem. You know, that's a, that's a class issue, that's an access issue. It's a huge, huge problem. Um, I think that in, you know, where I farm on Molokai is privately owned. It's a, owned by an absentee land, land owner who owns 14,000 acres of land on Molokai and has like, you know, a small portion of that in organic, um, well, it's all certified organic, but in vegetable production. Again, that's like a unique situation. It's not the norm. So 100%, I think that that is one of the biggest things that needs to be addressed if, you know, local sustainable farming anywhere, particularly places with really high real estate costs, um, for that to be uh, alleviated. I think the other part, what was the other part of your question? I was like, land access and... Um. Yeah, and contrasting it with your specific Yeah, okay. And just other other challenges, you know, um, Molokai is, is definitely really different than Oahu. I don't know anything about farming in trying to sell produce um, on Oahu, but on Molokai, one of our biggest issues as farmers, you know, for one, we are actually the only farm represented at the Kanakakai Farmers Market. So there's probably 100 vendors at most, and we are the only farm. So any other produce that's there, there's a few people that are selling produce from their backyards, they have little gardens, like a few really sweet aunties that you know bring the stuff that they gather and probably get from their family as well. There's one other produce vendor where 100% of her produce that she's selling is shipped definitely from off island and definitely see apples and all kinds of things that are not coming from Big Island, they're coming from all over the world really. Um, and so for us, you know, one of the biggest things is being at that market because that's one of the only places where people on Molokai have a chance to, to buy local produce. It's really hard for us to sell our produce in an economically sustainable way for our farm on Molokai because you can sell it to Honolulu for more money. We can sell it off island for a lot more money. So really the only reason that we've been able to do that at Puahoku Ranch is because we have a wealthy landowner. Um, and something that we've been working towards in building the farm program that we're building is trying to build a model that isn't dependent upon that. Because that's, you know, really scary. Who has a billionaire landowner? And, you know, it doesn't, it's just, that's not a sustainable model. So it's a huge problem. So there are a lot of farms on Molokai. I don't know the percentage, but most of that food is getting shipped off. So it's part of our goal, part of our mission to keep food on Molokai. We see oh, the trucks, you know, I do this little delivery every week to Kikua drive like a little pickup truck with one pallet of produce to Kikua, and I'll be there at YV when just these huge tractor trailers are coming in filled with produce that is leaving our island. You know, we go to, we have one little natural food store on Molokai that I think is actually closing down right now. It hasn't been open in about a week, and you go in there during like peak avocado season on Molokai, and the avocados are from Mexico because they're certified organic. So. I have a few different opinions about the like organic versus local because some stuff like that is bullshit, <laughs> you know. So it depends, and there's a big gray area there. And so to like come back to that too, it's got to be a discussion. It's not just local. It's not just organic. It's on you guys as consumers to know enough to know what to ask, to know what crops are treated in really dangerous ways, and to know what's going on enough because it's not as simple. As that, but for sure, like our biggest problem on Molokai selling produce is we're not, you know, we barely cover our expenses to go to the farmers market with what we make there and come back. It's really just like to get produce on Molokai, keep it there. Thank you. I'm gonna have to apologize and, and not take any more questions. Uh, so I'd like to have each of the panelists um, answer either the questions that have been posed or. Uh, give us a summary of what you think is the future for Hawaii and where we need to go, what we need to do 
in order for us to realize this vision of sustainable agriculture. So let's start with Penny. Sustainability, you need to keep the bees. So if you have a small property that you can have a hive, contact me. We always have something available that we can put on your property, and that will help because you'll get pollination from it. Not necessarily when you get honey, like I said before, because the bees not, don't necessarily stay there. But if they mm -hmm. like it, they will, and eventually you can get honey. And it would be really cool to have honey from your own area. That's what I do at my house. I have a hive, and I have Mualua Valley Honey, and there's no other thing like it. Um, but that would be my focus, would be then also to, um, my husband is working with some other people and we're trying to get legislature together so that if you have bees on your property that are wild, or in your property, in your home, in the walls, that you call a beekeeper first. You don't call the pest control people. You call us, you say, okay, can you help us get it out? And we will work with you, and we will take them out, and then we can rehome them. We don't destroy them. All of our bees are rehomed. So that is my outlook for the world. But Hawaii is such, because we're out here in the middle of the ocean, we need to make sure that we save our bees. Because if we don't, I have a slogan, it's on my thing there, it says, no bees, no seas, no means. That's my whole, that's me in a whole nutshell. Thank you. Um, I guess, you know, to kind of follow up on what I was talking about just a moment ago, I think that kind of with, you know, the sustainable agriculture movement, like here, like any, anywhere, I think, you know, anything you can do to create access to farmland to support young farmers. There's so many people that are just passionately trying to farm. Those things are amazing. I think that voting with your dollar as a consumer is one of the most powerful and important things that anybody can do and that that's really what's gonna be, you know, one of the big catalysts for change here in Hawaii and anywhere else. So, you know, educating yourself as consumers is just um, so important and really a huge part of the agriculture future in Hawaii for sure. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Um, I think getting young, and not just young, but new farmers on land is really important. Um, one thing that the Hawaii Farmers Union was doing this session was trying to get on-farm mentoring happening um, to give uh, new farmers sort of a, a background to draw from. Right now in Hawaii, to, to lease state ag land, you have to have um, almost $100,000 in assets, and that's super prohibitive. And then beyond that, there's um, a whole history of work that you have to show that you're not a high-risk investment. And so I think there's really an opportunity for high-risk loans to these new farmers, um, and I think that they, I, I've seen them uh, get onto land and be super productive. Um, just to, as an alternative, I think that um, work trade is also happening. It's, it lends itself to um, potential issues, but it's definitely um, happening in Hawaii. Thank you so much for coming to me. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, so 2016 is when the same day the voter registration happens. So get out there if you haven't registered to vote. If you know people who uh, ha are not registered to vote, especially younger kids who are down with the cause, get them to show up uh, at the vote voting booth and they can register right there. And that's how we can slowly change things. I would like to take a minute to promote our hui, the Environmental Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii and ask all of you to please check it out. Google Environmental Caucus Hawaii. You will see our name at the top of the list. It's about getting involved. This is how we learn. That was the fastest, fast track of learning I've ever experienced, just spending one legislative session from January till May, 
seeing everything that comes across the board in Hawaii. And if you want to understand these things and make a difference, you're going to learn all these things by going down there and participating. So mahalo again to Melissa and everyone here. Aloha. Thank you. So thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate your presence. We're going to have this on YouTube, so uh, be looking out for um, our, our panel to be shown, showing up in a, just a few weeks. Thanks to Don Hutton from Olelo. And, yes, and we're also going to have it on Olelo. So if you go to our Facebook page, Seeds of Truth, you can get um, the, the dates, the air dates for uh, this particular program if you or your friends were unable to catch all the details. So again, thank you for coming. We thank hope to you. have many more panels like this. We've got a long way to go to educate more and more people. And please go home and start growing your own food. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, that's it. We are live still at the Moili yes, uh, Community panels Center. Here at the front. But if you could help us Panel put away the on. chairs, that would be very, very great of you to the, uh, um, Future of Farming, Women the in the Future of Farming, the Feast or Famine. You. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop um, streaming because uh, I'll help put the uh, chairs away. Thanks. I'm going to let it run a little bit and then I'm going to... Um, Cut the uh, feed because live stream tends to truncate the beginning and end, so I want to uh, leave it run a little bit.